Now, if Aristotle had little to say uh, about induction, he had a great deal to say about deduction. And I want to look very briefly at his views of deduction because that is what wins for him the title of the father of logic, in other words, of deductive logic. For the first time in human history, he asks this question, what do we actually do when we defend a conclusion by stating premises? What is the actual structure of human reasoning when we engage in deduction? Now let's take the simple example. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Those are our premises. And on their basis, we come to the conclusion, therefore, uh, Socrates is mortal. Now our conclusion, uh, says Aristotle, taking this example, our conclusion, Socrates is mortal, relates two terms. Socrates is one, mortality is another. Our conclusion says there is a connection between the, those two. Socrates is mortal. Somehow our premises justify this conclusion. But how? Well, says Aristotle, observe that there is a third term besides Socrates and mortal, which appears in the argument, namely the term man. It appears in each premise. In one case, it's linked to the term Socrates, when we say Socrates is a man. In the other premise, it's linked to the term mortal, when we say men are mortal. What we do, says Aristotle, in reasoning is discover such a linking term, what he calls the middle term, which relates the two terms that we connect in the conclusion. And reasoning, therefore, is really the discovery of a middle term connecting two others. And therefore, every argument, he says, will have three terms. The subject of the conclusion, in the example I gave you, if the conclusion is Socrates is mortal, the subject will be Socrates, and that was called by later logicians the minor term. The predicate of the conclusion, in this case mortality, that's called the major term, and the linking or middle term, which occurs once in each premise but not in the conclusion, and that's called the middle term. That's the term which enables us to ground the connection in the conclusion. Now this type of reasoning Aristotle himself discovered and defined from scratch. And this is the type of argument he called a syllogism, a syllogism. Now I will give you not his, but a modern, but legitimate definition of syllogism. A syllogism is a deductive argument with two premises. It contains only three terms, two of which are linked in the conclusion, as a result of the linking of each of them with the third or middle term in the premises. Too fast? A deductive argument with two premises containing only three terms, two of which are linked in the conclusion as a result of the linking of each of them with the third or middle term in the premises. Reasoning, therefore, and explanation, and ultimately science. According to Aristotle, is always a quest for the right middle term, the term that explains and proves the conclusion. To give an example out of objectivism, suppose you want to show that price controls are wrong. One term is price controls, one is wrong. What is the middle term that explains and proves? The answer would be, in effect, compulsion. And then you say price controls are a form of compulsion. Compulsion is wrong, therefore price controls are wrong. And of course you would continue. Why is compulsion wrong? What is the middle term between compulsion and wrong? Well, you, if you take objectivist philosophy, you say compulsion is anti-mind. And the anti-mind is wrong, therefore compulsion is wrong, and so on. Now, the middle term does not always function correctly. For instance, pigs are mortal. Men are mortal. Therefore, men are pigs. <laughs> I have a middle term, namely mortal, but it certainly failed in its function. Or communists are atheists. You are an atheist, therefore you are a communist. We have three terms, but the conclusion doesn't follow. So when does it and when doesn't it? 
This question Aristotle answered exhaustively for every possible type of syllogism, and there is, if I remember correctly, 256 varieties. <coughs> and that means he had to classify all the types there are. The work in which he did this is the prior analytics. He had to define all the types of premises because it makes a big difference whether you say all men are mortal or simply some men are geniuses. If you have an argument with some, all your reasoning is affected thereby. And it makes a difference where the middle term is placed. Is it the subject of a premise or the predicate, etc.? He had to define, therefore, all sorts of fallacies which could be committed in reasoning syllogistically. This was the first time any of this was ever dreamed of being done. He formalized, systematized the rules of reasoning. His later followers proceeded to give a name particularly in the medieval period, to every valid type of syllogism. And they got to be so familiar with them that as soon as somebody uttered an argument, they'd call out its, the logical name for that particular type of syllogism. Uh, and they had a certain reason for the name, but I won't take the time for it. But for instance, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, is Barbara. And therefore, whenever uh, w they had such an argument, somebody would call out Barbara. And there's also Dario and Fizio and Bramptaria, et cetera. Now, Aristotle didn't go that far. That was for his uh, scholastic followers. But uh, the point is, he is the first man ever to think about the thinking process and define its rules. He did not say the last word on uh, this or, indeed, any other subject. I take that back. On certain subjects, he said the last word. Uh, there are other types of deductive argument besides syllogisms. But Aristotle is nevertheless correct that the syllogism is the essential deductive argument. And thus, Aristotle actually carved out the entire subject of logic for the first time. He identified the most common and crucial type of reasoning. He defined for the first time what it means to prove something, to prove it or explain it objectively on the basis of facts. And that was the sense I meant when I said the birth of reason. It means specifically the birth of reason. Reason as an explicit, conscious, defined, objective method. In that sense, he is the father of reason and logic. I want to continue and make one other point. Aristotle observed that it is not valid to demand a proof of everything. Because he said, what does proof consist of? Proof is the demonstration of a proposition by inference from premises. Well, suppose you have done that and somebody says to you, how do you know your premises are true? You have to know that the premises are true in order to establish the conclusion. Give me some proof of your premises. Well, suppose you give a proof and he says, ah, but your proof itself has premises. And what is the proof of those? And so on. Now, says Aristotle, there cannot be an infinite regress. Obviously, there must be starting points for all human knowledge, basic axioms. The alternative would be knowledge is impossible. Either we'd have to have an infinite regress, which is impossible, or our starting points would have to be arbitrary, in which case our conclusions would be equally arbitrary. If uh, we're, there were not axioms which we could know to be true without the need of uh, proof, all knowledge would be hypothetical. It would be of the form, if this, then, that we'd never know whether anything really was true. And that would, of course, be a contradiction. We'd be in the position of saying, we have reached the knowledge that there is no knowledge. There must, therefore, be basic self-evident truths, beginnings of knowledge. And Aristotle calls these the archai. A-R-C-H-A-I, that's the Greek for beginning, or first principle, in the singular A-R-C-H-E. These are at the foundation of human knowledge. Of these, it is improper to ask for proof, because they are the ultimate foundation of everything else. All proof consists of deriving from these archai their consequences. Deny them, and you wipe out the very concept of proof. Quote, to demand a proof of everything, I'm quoting Aristotle, argues want of education, unquote. <laughs> By which standard there are many uneducated people today, not excluding many PhDs.
But, said Aristotle, we must very, very carefully specify what we are entitled to regard as a self-evident axiom and what we are not. He wrote a great deal on this subject, the types of axioms, how they come to be known, at what point in time different ones come to be known, and so on. Simply can't go into this material because of its length. You could give a whole lecture on Aristotle's theory of axioms. But just a few points. First, he distinguished two general types of axioms. Those at the base of just one science or one branch of knowledge. For instance, if equals be added to equals, the results will be equal, which is a geometrical or a broader, a mathematical axiom. And on the other hand, the universal axioms, the axioms which you have to know to know anything. For instance, the laws of logic, to which we'll return in a moment. <clears throat> now, Aristotle's view is that in each science, there are special axioms unique to it, basic laws of its particular genus or area of study. The ultimate goal of a science, since its purpose is to understand, is to find these ultimate first principles. You induce and induce and induce deeper and deeper, but there can be no infinite regress. It's a finite universe. Consequently, says Aristotle, in each science we must ultimately reach its basic laws. When you reach these, you will grasp them to be self-intelligible. They will not require explanation or proof by reference to anything outside of themselves. Just as in mathematics, when you finally, for instance, reach a straight line as the shortest distance between two points, that is self-luminous, self-intelligible, and from it, in conjunction with others like it, you can deduce all the geometric theorems. Well, he thinks the equivalent will take place in all subjects. And thus, we reach actually the ultimate axioms at the end of our quest, so that the thing which is first in reality is the last in the order of our coming to discover it. And then, once we have reached this first principle, we turn around and travel backwards, deducing from it all of the laws and facts we earlier had reached by observation and induction. Now you see here the obvious influence of Plato's divided line. You travel up the line, hit the top, and turn around and deduce what you formerly had not arrived at deductively. But there are two crucial differences in Aristotle's version from Plato's. To begin with, the basic axioms are, and the basic definitions, I should say, the basic axioms and definitions are, for Aristotle, abstracted ultimately from sense experience and must be objectively defined. It is not a mystical goodness that you reach at the end. And secondly, Aristotle insists there is no one ultimate principle from which every subject is deducible. After all, as the father of logic, he knows something about the structure of reasoning. And he says you cannot have a term in your conclusion which did not appear in your premises. And therefore, if you want a mathematical conclusion, you have to have specifically mathematical premises. If you want a conclusion in the realm of physics, then your premises have to contain terms in the realm of physics, and so for psychology, etc. Therefore, Plato's goal of one all-encompassing insight from which everything flows is simply a myth. There are distinct sciences, each with its own basic premises, and the goal of each science is to grasp these, which, as I say, comes only at the end. Um, uh, thus, at least many of them come only at the end, the ones I've been referring to. There are many types of axioms which I won't here go into. Now, in this theory, Aristotle carved out for the first time the idea of a specific science. Prior to his time, there was only Sophia, or wisdom. You uh, want to know anything? You come under the lover of Sophia. Aristotle is therefore not only the father of logic, but of science. That is to say, of the very idea of a specific science, both from the aspect of a specific delimited subject matter and of an objective scientific methodology. In, that, in those two crucial ways, he is the father of science as much as of logic. Now. I said that there were universal axioms presupposed by all knowledge, no matter what the subject matter. And of course, of these, the most famous is the laws of logic, which in a way is Aristotle's supreme achievement. You know the law of contradiction. Nothing can be A and non-A at the same time and in the same respect. The law of excluded middle. Everything is either A or non-A at a given time and in a given respect. 
called excluded middle because the middle is excluded. It's either A or non-A. It can't be sort of A or partly non-A. It either is or it isn't, but there's no middle ground. That's why he called it the law of excluded middle, which is the metaphysically the antithesis of, quote, moderation and the middle of the road. Now, as to the law of identity, just for the record, although it always goes along with the other two and is regarded as an Aristotelian law, and although it's obviously all over the place in Aristotle implicitly, as a formally defined law, the law of identity was not discovered, as far as I can tell, until the 12th century AD by a philosopher known as Antonius Andreas. Uh, but that's just a minor wrinkle because it's always called an Aristotelian law because it's so obviously the same essential point as the law of contradiction and excluded middle. Contradiction and excluded middle, Aristotle defined and named. Now these laws, says Aristotle, are laws, the laws of logic are laws of all of reality. They are not laws simply of reality insofar as it consists of living things or of reality insofar as it consists of quantitative things. They are laws of reality insofar as it is real. They are laws of everything which exists insofar as it exists. In other words, in his famous expression, they are laws of being qua being. In other words, of everything by simply virtue of the fact that it is, no matter what it is. These laws, says Aristotle, the knowledge of these laws is a precondition of any acquisition of knowledge on any level in any field. You can't know anything without knowing them. You couldn't make the most rudimentary reasoning because being the laws of logic, they are presupposed to get, in some implicit form in your mind, they are presupposed to get from the premises to the conclusion. And the first time you grasp an argument, if I looked at you and said, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is not mortal, you either can tell that there's something wrong with that or you can't. If you can't, obviously you're in a bad way. If you can, it's because whether by knowing it explicitly or not, you know. But look, all men can, can't say all men are mortal, and here's one who isn't, because it's an A and a non-A. And in that implicit form, no one can get off the ground cognitively who doesn't know the laws of logic. How do we arrive at them then? Obviously not by reasoning. If we tried to arrive at them by reasoning, that would be impossible. How could we reason if we didn't know the principles of reasoning? And therefore, the only way we can arrive at them is by direct abstraction from self-evident sensory facts. We simply, says Aristotle, observe, this cup is not both red and not red. This table is not both green and not green. This lady is not both tall and not tall, etc. And at a certain point, uh, if we're not uh, too dense, we get the message, everything must be consistent, nothing can be A and non-A. That is simply self-evident. Now, in the translations of Aristotle, the faculty which grasps the self-evident is given the forbidding and misleading name intuitive nous. Nous, N-O-U-S, is the Greek word for mind. Aristotle was called the nous of Plato's academy. In other words, the brain of the school, you see. Intuitive, as used in translations of Aristotle, has no mystic connotations at all, not any. It simply means, intuitive news simply means the human mind in its capacity to grasp self-evident principles. As opposed to the deductive or reasoning noose which makes, draws conclusions from these principles. Now, as students of objectivism, I trust that you appreciate the importance and indispensability of the laws of logic, so I won't here comment further on them. The three parts of Atlas Shrugged are, of course, Ms. Rand's testimonial to her view of the importance of this discovery, the names of the three parts. I will observe that Aristotle also had to deal with uh, skeptics, people who said, well, it might be self-evident to you, but it's not self-evident to me. I don't accept these laws. Maybe that's just the way you were brought up, etc. You know, <laughs> the standard hot off the griddle modern skepticism, which is only two or three thousand years old. <laughs> and in a very famous chapter of his metaphysics, chapter Gamma, or book four, as it's called, 
rather book, not chapter. Aristotle offers a classic refutation of such opponents of the laws of logic. I want to give you an indication of it, at least. He devised on his own a brilliant technique to deal with all these objectors and skeptics with regard to the laws of logic. His reasoning was like this. If the laws of logic are truly the foundation of all human thought, then we should be able to demonstrate that even the objector has to rely upon them, that even he can't escape them, that these laws are truly inescapable. And so he says, I propose to show that even the man who denies the laws of logic must count on the laws of logic even to utter his denial. Now, if you can do that, you have taken care of the objector. This technique is called the technique of reaffirmation through denial. That is, the skeptic is forced to reaffirm the laws in the act of denying them. Now, how does it work? Aristotle says, get the skeptic. He's filled with valuable tips on how to argue with skeptics. And he says, because he had the sophists around him who were as good, if not better, than anybody in that department today. Because they were honest, straightforward, and you could know what they were talking about. <coughs> uh, Aristotle says, tell the skeptic to say something, anything, a word. He doesn't even have to say a whole phrase. But he has to say something meaningful or significant, not simply gibberish. Well, if it's meaningful, it has to mean what it means. It has to mean something. It has to have one meaning. And in other words, it has to exclude its opposite. In other words, it has to adhere to the law of contradiction. If the skeptic utters man, then he's got to mean by man, man, and exclude non-man. Why? Because A is A, and it's not non-A. If the law of contradiction weren't true, you couldn't utter an intelligible word or sentence. Every time you opened your mouth, you would not only say yes, but also no. Your words wouldn't mean what they mean. You wouldn't be saying what you're saying. Now, perhaps the simplest way to illustrate this uh, technique is by the following hypothetical uh, 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 conversation. The skeptic comes in and says to Aristotle, I'm paraphrasing Aristotle's presentation. The skeptic comes in and says to Aristotle, the law of contradiction is false. Aristotle says, I'm glad to hear that you accept it. <laughs> and the skeptic says, what do you mean accept it? I just said it's false. It's completely wrong. I don't believe it. Aristotle says, I'm glad that you are such an avid champion of the law of contradiction. And the guy says, look, I said my view. I reject it. I think everything is riddled with contradictions. It's A and non-A. I can't be any clearer than that. If it's false, it's false. <laughs> After all, A is A. <laughs> now, that is the technique of reaffirmation through denial. And it is completely inescapable. It follows, says Aristotle, that the true opponent of the law of contradiction cannot speak. It can maintain nothing. And I quote you now from Book Gamma of the Metaphysics, quote, And at the same time, our discussion with such a man is evidently about nothing at all, for he says nothing. For he says neither yes nor no, but yes and no. And again, he denies both of these and says neither yes nor no, for otherwise there would already be something definite. One who is in this condition <laughs> will not be able either to speak or to say anything intelligible, for he says at the same time both yes and no. And now, uh, close quote. And then the thought occurs to him, well, what about somebody like Cratylus, who would just think the contradiction in his own mind but not speak? So he adds this sentence, quote, and if he makes no judgment but thinks and does not think indifferently, what difference will there be between him and a vegetable?" Unquote. <laughs> now, he means that literally, not simply as an insult. In other words, it would be a man who's renounced his conceptual faculty, and therefore, in fact, has renounced his consciousness, and therefore is back on the level of vegetables, who are living entities devoid of consciousness. So such a man can maintain nothing. He can distinguish nothing, because of, from his point of view, nothing is anything. There is no identity, and consequently, there's no distinction between anything and anything else. <coughs> 
And by the same token, such a man can take no action at all. Now, I'll read you one more fairly lengthy quote from the book Gamma of the Metaphysics, because it's such a marvelous demonstration of Aristotle's interest and concern for life on Earth and for the actual practical meaning of abstract theories. He's talking about the people who deny the law of contradiction and what it would mean in actual practice if they lived by the theories that they preach. Quote, it is in the highest degree evident that no one of those who maintain this view, nor anyone else, is really in the position he claims. Why does a man walk to Megara and not stay at home when he thinks he ought to be walking there? Why does he not walk early some morning into a well or over a precipice if one happens to be in his way? Why do we observe him guarding against this? Evidently, because he does not think that falling in is alike good and not good. Evidently, then, he judges one thing to be better and another worse. And if this is so, he must judge one thing to be a man and another to be not a man, one thing to be sweet and another to be not sweet. For he does not aim at and judge all things alike when, thinking it desirable to drink water or to see a man, he proceeds to aim at these specific things. Yet he ought to do the other if the same thing were alike a man and not a man. But as was said, there is no one who does not obviously avoid some things and not others. Therefore, as it seems, all men make unqualified judgments. And if this is not knowledge but opinion, uh, I interject here, he has in mind the sophist to say, yes, we make uh, unqualified judgments, but after all, that's just a practical, pragmatic assumption. That doesn't represent knowledge, just opinion on our part. And Aristotle says, and if this is not knowledge but opinion, the skeptic should be all the more anxious about the truth as a sick man should be more anxious about his health than one who is healthy. For he who has opinions in comparison with the man who knows is not in a healthy state as far as the truth is concerned." Unquote. And therefore, the uh, famous summary of his view of the law of contradiction, the laws of logic, is the one that was quoted by uh, Miss Rand at the very end of Atlas, also from Book Gamma of the Metaphysics, where Ragnar uh, is reading the passage, and I will read it here just to summarize Aristotle's position on the law of contradiction and by implication all the laws of logic. Quote, the most certain principle of all is that regarding which it is impossible to be mistaken. For such a principle must be both the best known and non-hypothetical. For a principle which everyone must have who understands anything that is, is not a hypothesis. And that which everyone must know who knows anything, he must already have when he comes to a special study. Evidently, then, such a principle is the most certain of all. Which principle this is, let us proceed to say. It is that the same attribute cannot at the same time belong and not belong to the same subject and in the same respect." Unquote. Well, so much for Aristotle on logic as far as these lectures are uh, concerned. Now, our time is uh, short. So let me just, uh, from the host of other epistemological achievements of Aristotle, which there's no time even to hint at, let me mention just two other achievements. He was the first to give a formal definition of truth uh, that is valid. Uh, truth, after all, being the goal of reasoning. And his famous definition has subsequently come to be called the correspondence theory of truth. It's the idea that an idea is true if it corresponds to the fact, if it states the way things actually are. His uh, wording, as I recall, is to say of a, a that which is, that it is, or of that which is not, that it is not, is true. To say of that which is, that it is not, or of that which is not, that it is, is false. That's all. Truth is the relationship between a statement and reality when the statement corresponds to reality. Now, I know that sounds like just common sense, and no one could appreciate it until they steeped themselves in Kant, Hegel, Dewey, and the pragmatists. Only then would you be able to appreciate it, so I give up any attempt to make you appreciate it now until and unless you're familiar with the followers of Kant. And the second brief passing point I wanted to make is uh, 
that Aristotle was the first to organize and define in a systematic way a great many common and widespread fallacies of reasoning. Uh, he is, for instance, uh, defined for the first time formally a name, begging the question, equivocation, complex question, oversimplified generalization, composition, division, ignoratio elenchi, and a host of others. Uh, you can get them out of any logic text or the question period if you want. I'll be glad to answer what they are. Uh, but uh, it has been the basis ever since for the classification of fallacies taught in logic courses. Now, in general, and given all the omissions, you are still in a position to assess Aristotle's epistemological achievement in summing up. He was the first man to recognize the sensory basis of all knowledge and the validity of the senses. The first to recognize the nature of scientific explanation, the first to define the principles of definition, the first to grasp the need of induction, the first to grasp the nature and rules of deduction, and to create the syllogism from scratch, the theory of it. The first to grasp, both in content and method, the concept of a specific science. The first to grasp the need for and the nature of axioms. The first to enunciate the laws of logic. Now, he did not say the last word on most of these subjects, but he did say virtually the first. He is therefore the father of reason and of the scientific method in all of its essentials. This is his great imperishable achievement in the field of epistemology. But that is only what he did in epistemology. Could I please repeat uh, who was the author of the Law of Identity? Antonius, A-N-T-O-N-I-U-S. Andreas, A-N-D-R-E-A-S. I do not offhand know the source, but you can find it in Sir William Hamilton's book on the history of logic, the title of which presently escapes me. But there's only one Sir William Hamilton, so at least in philosophy. Could you briefly describe and indicate what gave rise to Aristotle's theory of intellectual intuition? Well, I can certainly do it briefly by simply saying that by intellectual intuition is meant nothing more nor less than Aristotle's view that the conceptual faculty has the power of grasping self-evident truth when it confronts it. As to his reasons for that, I gave them last lecture and I won't repeat them. Would Aristotle favor an analytic synthetic dichotomy? I have to presuppose you know what that means uh, so as not to present it. The answer is, if you interpret that to mean a dichotomy between the logical and the factual, then certainly no. He believes the laws of logic are facts of reality. But insofar as you interpret that to mean a dichotomy between necessary and contingent truths, then yes, he does make such a distinction, partly because he believes that essences are intrinsic. In this respect, he is a Platonist, and he does, this ties in with the point I mentioned earlier that he does not believe in universal causal necessity. Uh, for details on this, you'll have to wait till next week or read my article on the analytic synthetic dichotomy where I discuss it. What was Aristotle's most influential single contribution to thought? If I had to select one, I'd say the laws of logic. Please redefine a syllogism. A deductive argument. I assume you want to copy this. Containing two premises and three terms, two of which are linked in the conclusion as a result of the linking of each of them with the third or middle term in the premises. That is a modern definition. Aristotle defines syllogism much more broadly to mean, in effect, any process of reasoning or any process of deductive reasoning because he was not familiar with the fact that there are other types of deductive reasoning, or he didn't focus on them. But uh, syllogism is actually a more specific type of reasoning. Would you comment on the standard criticism of the correspondence theory of truth? Namely, that such a theory is fruitless since we can never get outside of our minds to validate that our ideas, in fact, correspond to reality. Yes, I'd like to know what in the world is the basis for such a premise. 
Now, of course, if you hold the view of all the moderns, Descartes, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Kant, etc., that all we perceive, or Protagoras, that all we perceive is our own subjective experiences, our own intellectual mental content, which becomes a little world inside our heads and that we are therefore cut off from reality, obviously then the correspondence theory would be no good. And that's just the grounds on which Kant and his followers rejected it, that reality is unknowable. But what is the justification of the premise that we do not perceive reality directly, only its effects on us? The answer is the argument that Protagoras gave, and that I gave you in this course. If you know the answer to that, you have no problem with this argument. The answer to that is Lecture 12. Begging the question, what is that? Begging the question is the fallacy, the logical fallacy, of using or assuming what you are trying to prove in advance of or as part of your proof, assuming the thing in question. One common form of it is circular reasoning. For instance, you go to a banker to borrow money, and he tells you he will loan you the money if he knew that you were reliable, but he has no verification of your reliability. And you say, well, I've got this friend of mine here, and this friend has known me for years, and he will uh, vouch for my reliability. And the banker says, well, that would be great, but the trouble is I don't know your friend. And you say to him, well, I've known him for years, so don't worry, and I'll vouch for him. <laughs> That is going in a circle, you see. Your reasoning is, I am reliable, therefore he is reliable, therefore I am reliable. Well, you're assuming your reliability to prove it. That's begging the question. And Aristotle maintained, uh, obviously correctly, that any attempt to prove the laws of logic, as distinct from stating that they were self-evident, would be begging the question. Because any reasoning relies on the laws of logic. The essence of reasoning is to say such and such premises. Now, since the laws of logic are true, such and such a conclusion follows. But if you tried to prove the laws of logic, if they were the conclusion of your argument, your reasoning would then be such and such premises. Now, since the laws of logic are true, therefore the laws of logic are true. You'd have to use them to prove themselves. And therefore, there is no such thing as a proof of the laws of logic. You can't prove the principles of proof. All you can do is point to reality. And if the guy sees it, OK. If he says he doesn't see it, you can try the reaffirmation through denial technique. If he takes the one out from that argument and becomes like Cratylus <laughs> and says, OK, then I won't talk at all, you can consider you did a good day's work. <laughs>
then if the person has a trace of civility, he will see that the fact is self-evident, and you can proceed. Uh, if uh, he doesn't, you simply let him define his own metaphysical status as non-existent and proceed accordingly.